Okay, so before we start, you might come in here real quick. I need to go in there. Okay, so I'm going to go into the final project real quick and just kind of go over it a little bit. So has anyone started it yet? Has anyone looked at it? No. Okay. So the project's going to be due the last week. That's a Thursday at noon. Okay. So just pretty much try to get it done by the 5th. And with the final project, you can get it done whenever. So if you get it done this week, you're done with the, you just got to take exam four and you're done. There's no final, final exam. So the project is going to be worth 15% of your final grade. <clears throat> Last semester, I had a lot of people, don't, they didn't do it. It takes up a big chunk of your grade if you, don't, if you don't do it. So the way it works is you're going to start with this final template here. So go ahead and download the final template. Okay, It's going to be a blank Excel sheet. Okay. Download and open it up. Okay, so this is what it's going to look like. And you're going to have four sheets down here. Okay. It's like a, adding a sheet to a notebook. So the whole thing is called a workbook. And then these are the different sheets. So starting on M2, this is going to be module two. So it's going to be stuff covering module two. So right now, everything on here we've done. So you, if you want, you can you can do the entire project. I'm not including hypothesis testing on there or even confidence intervals. So that's the template. I also have an example project up here uh, that I don't want you to copy, but I want you to kind of use it if you need it, like as a guide, especially if you're new to Excel. So I'm going to be looking for like, you know, design it a little bit, make it look presentable. Mm -hmm. um, kind of intended it to make it, make it like a, uh, a project that you want to show your boss in the future. Like you want to, you want to practice at doing stuff like this because most likely a lot of y'all are going to be doing this kind of stuff. Okay, so module two is going to be on mode, median, stuff we covered in module two. Module three is going to be regression. Okay, you're going to have to do the line of best fit, do some predictions, or actually I don't ask you to do any predictions. This thing here, this is bonus. But all this other stuff is going to be part of it. Okay. This is probability. Okay. I tell you to fill these in and then calculate the probabilities. And I have all these filled in for you. These are the right answers, but I want you to use formulas. Okay. To, to calculate them. So, like probability x less than four. Well, what numbers are le less than or equal to four? four, three, and two. So you're going to add these up to get that number. Okay, so I don't want you to just type in 0 0.167. I'm not going to give you credit for that. And then the last one, you're going to create a Z table. And again, the formula is not plugged in here. I have the real value plugged in here, but you're going to need to create a formula in this cell. That's all you need to do is create one formula and you'll be able to drag that over. I'm not going to do it now, but you drag it over and drag it all the way down and it'll populate the whole table. Okay. If you don't know what a Z table is, we haven't really used them in this class. So I wouldn't expect you to know what they are, but I do have it on Folio if you wanna take a look at it. So I have the Z table right here. What this is are probabilities of a standard normal. So if you pick a value here, it's gonna give you the area under the curve. So, What's the probability X is less than zero? 50%, right? Because if you're right in the middle of a standard normal, 50% this way, 50% that way. If you look at probability Z is less than 1.2, it's 84.61%. And that's, that's how you use the standard normal. Uh, I'm having you calculate from zero to three, but also, well, 3.6, but also from negative 3.6 to zero. So you're gonna have to do kind of like two. Two different formulas. Okay, and then this last part is just some 
probability. Uh, this is binomial, and then this is a normal distribution problem. Okay. So everything we've already done. And you'll notice I've added in these little scroll bars here. I think I've talked about this already. Um, ideally, if you do want to put them in, you'll get you'll get bonus. Um, but you'll need the developer tab for this one. And it just allows you to like maybe change this value by scrolling this back and forth. Okay. I don't have it, I don't have it synced up with it just because this is an example project. But that's something you may want to look at. Okay, let me go back to the project real quick. So yeah, I'm gonna do template. Um, so yeah, you're gonna start with a blank Microsoft Excel file containing just the numbers I give you. So you'll see there's gonna be four sheets, each labeled with a module. They're gonna be graded on accuracy, but also style. So if you turn in a black and white project, you're gonna get points off. Make sure your project stands out and has some color. Maybe add borders, conditional formatting, cell styles, fill color, text color, just styles though. And then, uh, so yeah, in summary, make sure make your project look like something you would want to present to a future boss of yours. Okay. Now, like I was just saying, if you use the developer tab, you'll receive bonus points. So if you put in scroll bars, you can put in like check boxes. If you want to check yes or no. So yeah, this stuff here. Uh, and then here are the specific instructions for each. So for the first one, I tell you calculate all these. Okay, for this one and this one, don't use the built-in formulas. But these, there's there's functions for it. it. Equals mode, it'll give you the answer. Equals median. Um, also, I want you to use cell references as much as possible. Okay, so if you're calculating the z-score, don't just simply type in the, the numbers. I want you to like type in some values. Like other cells. Okay. So if I want you to do one plus one, I don't want to see one plus one. I want to see like this cell plus this cell equals two. That way, if you go back and change it, it'll update some numbers. So one thing you, you may uh, need to use that for is the IQR. Remember, IQR is Q3 minus Q1. Okay. Okay. So, uh, module two, start calculating this stuff here. Um, standard deviation, you use the built in function. Make sure you use the correct one, okay? I know some people last semester, they calculated the wrong one and you're, it's slightly off. So if I give you this small set of numbers, it's a sample. These two here are really hard to just calculate in one cell, okay? Don't use the built-in function for them, okay? So do not use the built-in percentage percentile function. It's a bonus. If you can calculate it in one cell, okay, it's really hard to do. You need to use the average function, the offset, the count function, and then the ceiling and floor functions. What those do is they just round numbers up or down. So, like if you do the floor function of like 3.9, it'll round always round down. So it'll be three. Um, or if you don't want bonus, just take as many cells as you need to calculate it. Okay. Same with percentile. If you use one, one formula in one cell, you need these three functions, you get a bonus. And you can earn a lot of bonus on this project, okay? Z-score data point, okay. So if you wanna impress me, insert a histogram, okay? Excel doesn't have histograms built in. So there's like one little extra step. It's really easy, but yeah, if you do it, You'll get bonus. 
Okay, M3 is going to be on regression. Okay, so do a scatter plot, calculate the correlation. Well, calculate the correlation here. Right here, I just wanted to identify like, is it positively correlated, negatively correlated? Um, I want you to find the re uh, regression line. So find the coefficients. Use the built in functions for that. Now, if you use these fancy formulas, you're going to receive bonus because. We never really learned these. They were in the notes, but we didn't really calculate it this way. You'll get bonus for that. So if this is a little confusing, uh, I'd say to go back to lecture seven, I kind of explain how to calculate standard deviation. It's in a similar way. So you will calculate this part first, then this part, and then you'll divide it by each other. And then the last thing I want you to do the built-in regression function in Excel. Um, yeah, you need the analysis tool pack. Just Google how to do it. It's, it's, uh, it's not hard. Okay, then this part is gonna be probability. Okay, so consider the following experiment. You roll two fair six-sided dice. Let X be the sum of the two dice. So first thing I ask you to do is list all the combinations. So like, you can throw a one and a one, add to two, one and two, add to three, two and one, add to three, so on. List all the outcomes, find the probability distribution. And then I ask you just some probability questions. So find the probability of rolling four or less. Expected value, standard deviation. You guys remember the shortcut formulas for binomial? Oh, you mean the For the expected value? With a binomial. So n times p for the mean of binomial and the standard deviation is. Oh, okay. Um, also, you'll get bonus if you insert a histogram on this part as well. Okay. And in the last part, I'm asking you to create your own z table. Okay. So, like I was saying before, you need one, just one formula. Okay. So you'll type in your one formula here. I'll give you a hint. It involves a normal distribution function. And that one formula, you'll be able to drag it over and drag it down all the way to zero, negative zero. And then here you'll slightly modify the formula to account for um, the positive numbers and drag it over and drag it down. Okay. And then binomial questions and normal questions. Okay, so if you're still with me, there's one more thing I need to tell you about. So if you go to my media, I'll, I'm gonna upload this on the main page so you'll be able to see it. And I have a tutorial here for Excel. Now this Excel or this tutorial is like 27 minutes. I pretty much do this part for you. So if, if you're having trouble with this part, watch the tutorial and it, I'll explain how to make the, the Z table. Okay. okay. Uh, that's it for the final project. So I recommend you just go ahead and get started on it. Don't wait till last minute because there was a bunch of people who it took longer. It's going to take a while. You know? Especially the end of the year, you got other final exams for other classes. Just go ahead and get it out of the way. Okay. So let's start lecture 25. Basics of hypothesis testing. Okay, so We've seen how to calculate statistics. We've seen how to find probabilities. We've seen how to find confidence intervals. Now we're gonna look at hypothesis testing. So how good are those statistics we calculated? Are they valid? Okay. So at the beginning of the semester, 
we talked about the babies choosing toys based on how nice they behaved. I don't know if you guys remember, there was like a square and like a rectangle. No, a square and a triangle. Uh, anyways, I'll, I'm gonna pull the video up here so you guys can see it. If you don't, if you wanna see it, you have to come up. Hey, you guys remember this one? Yeah, so the guy's trying to get up the hill and anyways, the square helps the circle up and then the triangle pushes the circle down and then they bring the, the toys out to the kids and they, they choose which one they want. And like 90% of the time they choose the square because it was nicer. Um, but we need to ask ourselves, like, uh, are they, is it just a coincidence that they pick the square? Or is there like, is there like a significant reason? Um, and we, you can't just, in statistics, you can't just observe something and say, oh yeah, uh, the square is obviously being picked more because it could have been random. We need to ask ourselves, is it, uh, that we need to create a statistical method to test that question. Okay. And that's what a hypothesis test is. Okay. It's answering that question using math. Okay. So in general, a hypothesis test is a systematic method for evaluating a claim. Okay. A claim like the square is chosen more than the triangle. Right, that would be a hypothesis test. That would be fun. Okay, so here's the intuition. So before we get into like the details, think about it like this. So start with a base assumption. So maybe for the square and triangle thing, maybe we'll assume, let's assume they're random, right? The chance of picking a triangle or a square is 50-50, right? If we observe something unlikely, so what would be unlikely? If the square was chosen 90% of the time, right? If we expect them to pick the square and triangle half and half, but they choose it 90-10, that would be unlikely, okay? If we observe something unlikely, if the assumption is true, we will take that as evidence that the assumption is false. So like I was saying, assume the triangle and the square are 50-50. If we observe like they pick the square 90% of the time and that assumption is true, we're gonna take that as evidence that the assumption is false. Okay. So at the end, we would assume, okay, it wasn't 50-50. There was some kind of leaning toward the square. Okay. So for each test, there's two hypotheses. Okay. The first one we call the null hypothesis. Okay. Uh, represented as H naught, okay, or a subscript zero. Okay. The null hypothesis is assumed true until presented with evidence otherwise. Okay. So this is what we're going to assume. Okay. It usually represents the status quo, the default state, or is a statement of no difference. Okay. It receives the benefit of the doubt. Now, the alternative hypothesis represented by H sub Z, uh, A or H1 is only chosen if there's strong evidence in its favor. Okay, it has the burden of proof. So the way I like to think about this is in the justice system. You don't go into court being assumed guilty. 
right? You go into court being assumed innocent and you're only guilty if they, there's enough evidence to make you guilty, right? So kind of like this. So the, your null hypothesis going into the court is that the accused is innocent. And you're only, well, this is like hopefully, right? You're only accused guilty if there's strong evidence in its favor, right? If the glove doesn't fit, you know, you need strong evidence that the accused is guilty. Okay, so there's two possible conclusions here. You either do not reject the null, right? That means there's insufficient evidence, right? Do not reject, that means you didn't, uh, you did not reject this. So you're kind of, uh, there wasn't enough evidence to show guilty, so you're assuming innocent. Another conclusion is rejecting the null, okay? So that means you had enough evidence, so you're rejecting this and saying there's evidence that the acute, that the alternative hypothesis is true. Okay. So this is just kind of like a statistical thing. Don't really get too bogged down in this part, but notice that you don't explicitly accept H0 because it hasn't been proved. Okay. So just because someone's innocent, it doesn't mean they're innocent. It just means they haven't been proven guilty. Make sense? Just like a jury says not guilty instead of innocent, we say not H A instead of H zero. Make sense? Like in uh, in court, the jury says they're not guilty. They don't say they're innocent, right? Okay. So I think everyone's pretty familiar with the justice system. This example might really help you when it comes to hypothesis testing. All right. Let's talk about the types of error. Okay. So hypothesis tests don't always reach the right conclusion. Sometimes they make mistakes, okay? It's useful to understand what comes, kinds of mistakes are possible. Okay, so the first type of error we call a type one error. This occurs when H naught is true, but you reject it, okay? So the person's really innocent, but they're proven guilty, right? That's a bad thing, right? That's a, we call that a type one error. This is often considered more severe error, right? It would be worse for an innocent person, innocent person to go to jail than a, a guilty person to get let out of jail, right? It'd be worse to send an innocent person to jail. So a type one error, this is often considered the more severe error. The probability of type one error occurs when H naught is true is denoted by alpha, okay? So it's like a little, Alpha, it's a Greek letter. We will see that you get to choose alpha as part of the testing process. Alpha is also called the significance level and is the complement of the confidence level. Okay, so we've already talked about confidence levels. It's uh, the complement, one minus it. In other words, the significant level and the confidence level should add up to one. Okay, y'all get on that. All right, and then there's one more error we're gonna talk about. So a type two error, this occurs when, well, the other is true, right? So this occurs when H naught is true, but you fail to reject the null. Okay, so kind of like the person's guilty, but you fail to arrest them or fail to uh, prove them guilty which that's still an error, but you see how it's not as bad as type one error. The probability of a type two error is denoted by beta, okay? So it's like a, it's like a B, but the line is like a little farther down. It's called beta, the Greek letter. Beta is a little more complicated to deal with and is used for planning studies, but we won't get into that this semester. Okay, I like to use a table to help me keep track of which error is which, okay. So these are the conclusions from evidence. These are the reality. So in reality, if H naught is true and you reject the null, that's a type one error. 
if H naught is true, but you fail to reject the null, well, then you didn't make an error, okay? If H A is true, test rejects H null, no error there. And then this would be a type two error. So again, it kind of helps me to think about uh, innocent and guilty, right? So if in reality, the person's guilty and they're proven guilty, then there's no error. In reality, the person's guilty, but they fail, they fail to prove them guilty, then that's a type two error. Okay, so notice that alpha and beta are inversely related. So even though you get a choose alpha, the chance of type one error, you don't wanna make it too small or that will have a high chance of a type two error when the null is false. Okay, so let's do an example here. So you probably already saw the answer, but we'll cover it up. So if a guilty person is set free, what type of error has occurred? You may need to go on the, okay. <laughs> it's okay. So if a guilty person is set free, so kind of like, let's just go back to here. So if a guilty person is set free, that means they were HA, but we failed to reject this. So HA is true, but you failed to reject H naught. Or think of it as they were guilty, but they were proven not guilty. And then they, you can have to think of this as they were innocent, but they were proven guilty. Okay, what about if an innocent person is sent to jail? Remember, that's the really bad one. That's called type one. So just remember type one is the worst one. All right, so yeah, so these kind of like just HA is true in reality, but they choose H naught. H, H zero or H naught is true in reality, but they choose HA. All right, so now let's look at statistical hypotheses. Okay, so this is kind of like the uh, intuition behind it, how you should think of them. In statistics, hypothesis tests are used to test claims about population parameters. Right? Remember, population parameters are a big part of statistics. We're trying to find these, right? They're usually unknown. We want to know something about them. So we may test the claim that, um, let's test the claim that the, all the students at Georgia Southern have a height of less than 5.9 or five, five foot nine. That may be something we want to test. Okay, so in this class, we test claims about mu and p, right? Population mean and the population proportion. If the null hypothesis is rejected, we say the result is statistically significant. So a statistical null hypothesis always has an equals form. A statistical alternative hypothesis can have a less than, greater than, or not equal to form. So the first two are one-sided test and the last one is a two-sided test. So here are the examples uh, of what you might see. Okay, so whenever you have a test, what you're trying to claim or what you claim, what you're trying to test is always gonna be your alternative. And then you're gonna assume the opposite, okay? So just notice here, the H naught 
it's always going to have an equal sign. And then the HA is going to have the sign of whatever you're testing. So if the question says they want to test whether the population mean is less than 35, well, then that's your alternative and your null is here. That's just, that's something really important you got to remember. So the type of the test always comes from HA. Okay. So you'll see when I do examples, I always write HA first because that's in the problem. All right, all good. Oh, and then I have lower tail. So if it's a less than sign, if it's a greater than, it's an upper tailed test, and then a two sided test if it's this. All right, so there are two methods for performing a hypothesis test, okay? So we will do the rejection region approach first. So I actually, I prefer the p-value one, um, but we'll, we'll do that next. So both methods use something called a test statistic. Okay, a test statistic is a number used to determine how unlikely a sample is if H naught is true. Okay, so kind of go back to the like the square and the triangle thing. So a test statistic might be what's the proportion of squares chosen? Well, if we calculated that and we got nine out of 10, that's unlikely, right? If we assume they're equal, 50-50. So a test statistic, yeah, it's just the number used to determine how unlikely. So we'll, we'll, you will always know what the test statistic test statistic is okay it'll be uh it'll be a formula somewhere some values of the test statistic are expected and not considered evidence against the null hypothesis but extreme values are unusual and are considered evidence against the null hypothesis right which makes sense right you should only you know prove them guilt they're only proven guilty if there's enough evidence if there's strong evidence uh, against them being innocent for most of the tests we do in this class, the test statistic can be interpreted as a z-score, okay? So that's good because then we can just use the standard normal, normal distribution, zero, one. Only the last test, so the chi-square test, will have a test statistic that's not a z-score. Okay, so what are the distributions we've talked about in this class? We talked about binomial, normal, t, and there'll be one more we talk about at the end, um, but uh, we won't talk about that right now. Okay. So whenever you're doing a problem, follow these steps for the rejection region method. Okay. First thing you do, formulate your hypotheses, okay? H naught and HA. Then make sure the necessary assumptions are met, okay? Next thing you do, calculate a test statistic. Uh, in this class, this will be a z-score or a t-score of your sample statistic. And then using alpha, okay, remember that's your level of significance. That'll be given in the problem. Determine which values of the test statistic are too extreme, okay? This is the rejection region. Okay, so if that test statistic is inside the rejection region, well, we reject the null. And that's why it's called rejection region, because if it's in there, we reject the null and choose HA. Otherwise, you fail to reject the, uh, the null. Uh, here's just a little note here. Uh, sometimes instead of fail to reject, we'll write FTR. All right, so. Yeah, whenever I first learned this stuff, I thought it was really confusing. So. Okay, so let's do an example here. Okay, the mean weight mu of a potato chips in a bag is advertised to be 12 ounces. Okay, 
my bags seem to be mostly air, so I claim that the mean ounces is less than 12. Okay. If I were to run an experiment, so, so this mu right here, the mean weight can't be measured, right? You can't buy every potato chip bag in the world and, and test those, right? But we're gonna do a claim on this one. And we're gonna try to gather enough evidence to maybe uh, test against it. So, they, so I claim that the mean ounces is less than 12 that they're ripping us off, right? If I were to run an experiment to test my claim, what would be the appropriate null and alternative hypotheses? Okay, so like I was saying uh, here, and maybe like put a circle around this, the, the type of test always comes from HA. With that being said, I always do HA first. So HA, and then we want to prove that the mean of all the potato chip bags is less than 12, right? This is what we're trying to prove, right? We wanna prove that the mean of all the potato chip bags is less than 12. And then, then we write H zero and that's just the opposite, okay? Or equals to, uh, pretty much always write equals to. Okay, make sense? Okay, so let's do another example. I once had a pair of pet rats, Nacho and Queso. One night, Nacho ran into the linen closet and would not come out. Before reaching in, I chose uh, the null, Nacho would not bite, over the alternative, Nacho would bite. Okay. As it turned out, she bit me. What type of error did I make? So, so let's, let's think about this. So as it turned out, she bit me. Uh, so Nacho would not bite, Nacho would bite. So HA happened, right? The, the, the rat did bite. Um, but we, we, uh, we claimed that Nacho wouldn't bite. So we assumed that Nacho would, uh, well, I said that backwards. <laughs> There's too many knots. So we wanted to, cl we claimed that Nacho would bite. Okay. So we assumed that Nacho wouldn't bite. Um, as it turned out, she did bite me. So what type of error? So kind of think of it as, in reality, they were guilty, but um, they were innocent. It's a type two error, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they definitely can get confusing. So, you know, you may have to read it multiple times or whatever. So, okay, so that's that's the basics of hypothesis testing. So I know everything's a little vague right now, probably wondering what's going on, like what is, what is all this stuff. In the next lecture, we'll, uh, we'll do some real world examples and see how we can use hypothesis testing. All right, so you got a quiz due tonight, quiz 24. And uh, just a reminder, you know, go ahead and start on the final project if you can, if you have time. It'd be better to start it now than when, I, when you have all your final exams, right? Well, I give you the numbers okay. and you just need to like, you know, calculate everything on your own. Oh, okay. Yeah, you just open it. Like if you read the instructions, it'll, it'll, okay. it's pretty clear. Yeah, if you ever have any questions, 
just as in during class or whatever. Or if you want, um, I do do office hours. No one ever comes to them, but I have office hours. Or if that doesn't work, we can do a Zoom call anytime. Okay. I know it's not one of the buildings, but can you just tell me your office hours? Um, before this class, mm -hmm. before this class, so like 10 to 11. Okay, okay. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah, but then I gotta wake up earlier. I'm just kidding. I mean, I'm, I'm already up anyways, I'm kidding. Okay, we have it in. Hey, uh, just a reminder though, when you, if you do more office hours, you gotta like schedule them. That way I know you're coming. Okay. All right, any questions on Zoom? Go ahead and end it.